Welcome to the Gem Series, powered by Rocket Level. On this podcast, we empower entrepreneurs to succeed by setting big goals, executing like a pro, and having a fearless mindset. The Gem Series is all about investing in yourself. We're here to share the path to getting what you want out of life by sharing the stories of entrepreneurs who have done this themselves, providing thorough research from our team on what careers and habits are yielding the best results, and discussing the mindset it takes to overcome the obstacles that all future entrepreneurs will face. Investing in yourself starts with putting in the work every single day, and this podcast is here to help you do exactly that. My name is Blake Chapman. I'm the Vice President of the Ambassador Program here at Rocket Level, and I am thrilled to be your host for the Gem Series. Hello, and welcome to today's Gem Series. I am uh, absolutely thrilled to welcome today's guest, Dre, Dre All Day Baldwin. Uh, just to give you guys just a tiny bit of background, Dre is the CEO and founder of Work On Your Game. He has appeared on four different TED Talks, authored 33 books, and had a nine-year professional basketball career where he played all across the world. I am super pumped to have him on. Dre, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing amazing, Blake. I'm excited to be here. Looking forward to this conversation. Hey, so am I. I've been, uh, I've been super excited about it. And for anybody that doesn't know a ton about you, Dre, uh, could you just give just a little, a little bit of your background? Yeah, I'll give you the two-minute version. Uh, come from the city of Philadelphia, PA, now live in Miami, Florida. I uh, always played sports growing up, played you know, all the backyard driveway sports, uh, eventually settled on basketball around the age of 14, which is pretty late for an athlete who's trying to go somewhere in the sport, let alone, I mean, college, let alone pro. But uh, that was the situation. Only played one year high school basketball, uh, sat on the bench that one year. I scored two points per game. I like to tell people that if that was hockey or soccer, I'd be in the Hall of Fame. But in basketball, <laughs> yeah, it's not much. So uh, getting out of high school, I still want to keep playing. But wasn't didn't, I didn't have anybody recruiting me to come play in college. So I did go to college, but I walked on, which means for those who don't know, you just literally walk in the gym. And you had to try to prove yourself as a nobody who's nobody who nobody has ever heard of. I was able to do that successfully, but I was playing at the Division three level, which is the third tier of college sports. So when you watch the college football championship, that's D1, March Madness, that's Division one. I. I was down Division three and they don't usually produce pro athletes. So getting out of college. I played in college, but I didn't you know set the world on fire. And anyway, it wouldn't have mattered because I was playing Division Three against guys who weren't trying to be pros. So when I, I got out of college, my first job out of college was actually working at Foot Locker as an assistant manager. I worked at Bally Total Fitness uh, selling gym memberships. So this was not a basketball career. Then a year removed from graduation, I went to an event called Exposure Camp. And there I basically it was like a job fair. I basically played myself into pro basketball at that point. Uh, started playing pro ball. That was 2005. Now, the footage from that event, I that footage was on this thing called a VHS tape. Wait, you remember those VHS? <laughs> oh, I remember them. <laughs> yeah. So so I took that VHS tape and I put that footage on this brand new website called YouTube. And YouTube was a site that said you can put as much footage up as you want for free. So I just put that video up just for myself. But basketball players started finding me. So those players started leaving comments and just asking me, how often do you practice? Can you make videos about this and that? And that kind of started this parallel career. So I'm playing pro basketball overseas. My first job was in Commerce, Lithuania. At the same time, I have this audience on YouTube, which wasn't, there was no business there, but I had an audience of people watching me on the internet. So I had these two careers going at the same time. Uh, fast forward through this, I'm sure we'll fill in these gaps in this conversation, but uh, uh, about halfway through my career was about 2009. I found myself unemployed. And that's when I started focusing a little bit more on what we now call building a brand on the internet. That was selling products, writing books, et cetera. I totally. stopped playing pro ball in 2015. And ever since then, I've been you know, running this company, work on your game. So I'm sure we'll fill in the gaps in the last uh, 20 years. Man, that's, I got that's a, a lot question. of questions for you, Dre. <laughs> I, uh, I'll try not to blurt them all out at once here. I, uh, man, I, so I, I'm always curious. So going way back to when you were 14 and you decided on something, yeah. where, what was kind of going on in your life that made you go, you know what? I'm, I mean, was it like a, a, a pretty conscious decision to go, I'm going to really go all in on basketball or what, what was happening around that time? Well, it was conscious and I mean, the mind of a 14 year old and I'm going to go make it as a basketball player, but there was sure. no, I didn't have any tangible proof that it was actually going to work. It was just me decide. I would always play sports and I'm an athlete. So I've always been athletic. So I played you no know, two hand touch football in the backyard uh, never really played on a football team. My family couldn't really afford football equipment. Played a little bit of baseball, kickball. You know, we would run foot races in the streets and all that stuff. Yeah. 
And basketball is just a sport that I ended up stumbling upon simply because where I come from, neighborhood I come from, anybody can play basketball because you don't need equipment. You just need one ball and, you know, you have 50 people. You got a game. So that's how I kind of got into it. Everybody played and you know everybody gave it a shot. Every young man gave it a shot in my neighborhood. But I just happened to stick with it. And I could feel myself getting better, even though I didn't have any tangible proof that I was going to do anything with it. I was just uh, dumb enough to keep trying. And that's how it ended up working. That's I I mean, I love that that relentless mindset, you know, because mm. it's it's kind of wild if you are uh, somebody that's relentless enough. I mean, you can go pretty far. There's a lot that comes with that, obviously. But uh, right. I, I love seeing people that keep driving and pushing forward no matter what. I mean, yeah, take me a little bit further, I guess, like into college. Where, what were you thinking about in terms of what you wanted for yourself? What was kind of your what was your goal at that point in time, you think? Good question. So by the time I got to college, now I'm seriously thinking like now I'm thinking about what am I going to do when I get out of school? Because I mean, that's the purpose of going to college is to get prepared for quote unquote real life. Right. So Mm -hmm. the adults around me growing up, including my noted teachers that I had in schools, they all had no jobs. They had employment. But the thing about the adults that I saw growing up, especially in my neighborhood, was that they were always at work. They uh talked about work as a necessary evil. They didn't talk about it. I get to go Mm. to work. It was, I have to go to work. And they were always there. Uh, They seemed to dread Sunday nights, right? Because Monday's coming up. They got to go to work. (laughs) Yeah. And then they, on top of the fact that they were always at work, they didn't have any extra money. At least the adults that I saw growing up. So I'm Mm -hmm. like, okay, I don't want to do that. But the whole thing of going to school was to get ready for that. So I'm really, I'm urgently looking for any other opportunity. So- Uh, I saw I got came across uh, network marketing when I was in college about halfway through and at one of those hotel meetings, even though I didn't stay in network marketing, I'm glad that I did go to the meetings because they introduced me to personal development. And one of the books they introduced me to was Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Mm -hmm. Kiyosaki. So when I read that. Right. So when I read that book, he was talking about principles of entrepreneurship that kind of flew in the face of what I had been told by my teachers and the adults around me growing up. And I said, whatever he's talking about, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do basketball first and I'm going to do that. So that was my mindset was I'm going to play basketball. Then I'm looking for ways that I can kind of do whatever he's talking about in that book, even though I couldn't really understand all of it. So when I got out of college and I started playing basketball, I'm figuring I'm going to do that. But we know that sports end. You know, your sports career ends usually at the time that many people are hitting their stride in other professions. Your career is over. Right. So you're starting a, a brand new thing. So that is what I had in mind. So uh, tell me again what your question was. I forgot what you even asked. me. Yeah. Before. Yeah. No, I uh, <laughs> that, no, that that definitely that definitely answers it. I was just kind of wondering what the the end goal was at that point in time. It, and that definitely answers it. It's fine. Find something that beats out these kind of like broken narratives we all have about about working, you know, I mean, growing right. up, everybody's like, uh, work sucks, <laughs> you know, like you just, yeah. you go to college and then you kind of don't have that much money and you scrimp by and, uh, you, you, you just do what you got to do until maybe you can retire, hopefully. So it sounds like you were looking for maybe an alternative. If I think that would right. maybe be fair to say. Um, right. So let me, let me add on to that. So yeah. it was, it was playing the basketball and then, so in college, I knew I wanted to go play pro basketball, and I happened to have a teammate who knew a little bit about playing professional basketball overseas, mm-hmm. and he's the one who told me, hey, you got to go to a an exposure camp. It was basically like a job fair or a casting call for athletes. So I knew about that, and then I just kept what I heard from Kiyosaki in the back of my mind because I knew at some point sports is going to be over. I'm going to do something else. What else can I do? So yeah. that's, that's the kind of mindset I had in that, those early years, about 2005 through maybe 2009. A lot of people don't know a ton about rich dad, poor dad either. What was like, what was your big epiphany that you, that you got from, from that at that time, you think? Man, uh, are you going to limit me to just one? Um, so, <laughs> Hey, no limit uh, here. <laughs> yeah. So, so the first one, Blake, was that he said, uh, rich people don't work for money. And I'd always thought that in order to make money, you had to go to work. I mean, that's what had, that was the equation that had always been communicated to me. Yep. I would ask my parents for money. They say, well, do you have a job? <laughs> right. Cause that, <laughs> that, that's what they were saying. Like, you don't have, yep. any, you don't have a job. You don't have any money. So when he said that, I said, wait a minute, what? Like, this is goes against <laughs> everything I've been taught for the last 21 years is that rich people don't work for money. And just that he's talked about how rich people acquire assets and let the assets work for them instead of them mm. working for the assets. So I said, whatever this guy's talking about, he's onto something. 
Absolutely. And I, again, I didn't quite know what to do with that information. But when I read it, I said, I'm going in whatever he's doing, I'm doing that. And that's the mindset that I, I was in. So again, I already knew I was going to do basketball first. But after basketball, I was going to figure out how can I take what he's talking about and apply it to my life. And you started putting stuff on YouTube in like 2005. That's pretty early. Right. What what uh, yeah. what kind of what drew you to that? You know, like, yeah, well, well, the first thing was just a simple it was just a simple necessity. I had this footage on a VHS tape. So, you yeah. know, if you give a VHS tape in the sun or you drop it or it gets in water, footage is gone. So when I saw, I'm a, I've always been a big computer geek. I've always mm -hmm. used the internet a lot. So when I saw, I was on the internet and I saw this new website that said, you can put as much footage up here for free as you want. I just got that VHS tape. I got the data transferred onto a data CD and I put that on YouTube. And that wasn't for, I wasn't trying to build a brand. I wasn't, I wish I could say I was that visionary, but, but I was not. <laughs> I was just putting the footage up there just for me, just to have that footage yeah, somewhere no, that, that couldn't get lost. Yeah, that's yeah. the only reason I put it up there. And then- people just started finding it. Random people just start finding my footage and they weren't looking for Dre Baldwin. They were looking for basketball. And I happened to be doing basketball. And I looked like, I guess when they saw the video, I looked like I knew what I was doing. So yeah. they just figured, all right, this guy knows more than me. So how about let me ask him, he can help me. So they were basically going to the internet to crowdsource knowledge. Whereas you no, know, in our era, we had to figure it out on our own. Either, you know, somebody personally who can help you or you're by yourself. Whereas mm -hmm. this this next generation, people who are, let's say, 10 years younger than me, they could go to the Internet and get information from people who they never even met and never would meet. So they had an advantage over my generation. So when I saw them asking the questions that immediately told me and this was an inflection point here. But are these people just want to learn how to play basketball? I know how to I can teach them how to play. So why don't I just make more videos? So I just took my little mind. This is the time before we had video cameras on the phones. So you had sure. to have a phone and a camera. So I was take my little hundred dollar camera with me to the gym every day. Yeah, I didn't even have a tripod. Like I would just put the camera on the bench next to the basketball court <laughs> and just press record. I wasn't even stopping the video or anything. I just let it record the whole workout. And then I would just take all the footage and I would just pick little parts that look good. And I would put them on YouTube. That's all I did for the first Man. three to five years. I would just randomly take little clips that I thought looked impressive or would be yeah. useful for players. And I would put that on YouTube whenever I got around to it. Because, again. There's no money to be made from putting videos on YouTube in 2007. All right, you're just putting the videos mm -hmm. up for what? All right, totally. Nobody knew it, what was coming that we have now. Well, I think that looking, you know, even if you aren't looking ahead, it's interesting that whenever I look at those videos, I see so much consistency across the board. And this is something that I noticed mm -hmm. across like a lot of top performers and top athletes and entrepreneurs that anything they do, there's a certain, there's, a, there's like a level of consistency because that's what it takes to do something correctly. And I mean, even before we hopped on this call, I was, uh, I was scrolling through. I'm like, I'm like, Dre just uploaded a video seven hours ago. Like <laughs> that's what, or that's what it said on there. I'm like, man, you stay, you stay pretty, pretty nonstop on that. And it seems like it's been, it's been going great. I mean, I saw the one video had like 1.1 million. So I guess mm. I'm kind of reflecting on all this work that you've been doing, but Something that I, I wanted to kind of ask about a little bit was whenever you're, you know, whenever you're putting these up, did you start noticing demand and then going to that demand? Is that kind of how that, that worked or, or what was, how did you start developing your, you know, your brand and what you knew was what the people wanted? So with the basketball stuff, really, I was just, I really just started just putting out whatever I had that I thought would be useful for the players because there was so much. I mean, yeah. by that point, I'm playing at the pro level. So I pretty much anything you could do on a basketball court, I knew how to do it. So it was just a matter of or how do I get all this stuff recorded and just start putting this stuff out. So from 05 to about you know, about a 10 year span, I was just coming up with I was just writing down every idea I had and then just putting them out on video. So I knew I already knew what the players needed. And mm -hmm. they would kind of ask for stuff at certain times, but most of the time I already had done it. So it was really just coming up with different ways of explaining the exact same stuff over and over again. And yeah. that's what I was really doing with the with the basketball players. It wasn't really so much um what they were asking for because I was already ahead of them. I was already mm -hmm. 10 steps already ahead knew. of them. Because, yeah. yeah, I knew what they needed better than they knew yeah. what they needed. So it was just coming up with different ways of giving it to them for the basketball stuff. Now, as far as the stuff post-basketball, 
actually my audience is stronger when it comes to like audio and uh, written materials. It's based on what I'm selling these days because I'm not I'm not talking to the same audience. So it's a little bit different. But in basketball, it's really just uh, giving them everything that they needed on that specific thing. That's that's awesome, man. And I, I was also whenever you were, were first kind of talking about everything that you've done and your quick bio, I was thinking about it. And how much were you spending a fair amount of time in these and like all over the world then at that season of life? Like, were you hanging out in a different country for like a month or two at a time at that season? Yeah, it'll, it'll be more time than that. So the Dang, uh, pro basketball man. season is like the same length as the NBA season. So it starts does, in the fall, ends in the spring. How, how does that kind of shape your worldview? I mean, like, what was that doing to your brain at that time? <laughs> Being well, in all those different places. It was a great experience, Blake, because you get to see uh, different parts of the world that I otherwise would not have seen. You know, I had never even been on a vacation anywhere, not even in the United States, before I started playing pro ball overseas. So I'm yeah. in different countries in Europe. I'm in Mexico. I'm uh, even traveling in the United States to see places based on basketball that I otherwise would not have seen. So it just makes you a, a well-traveled person. I mean, you've seen different types of, you've seen different parts of the world. You see different things. You have different experiences. So it kind of just opens your mind up. I mean, I don't know how else to say it because I can't compare it to anything else. Because that's what totally. I know. You know, but when I think of someone who hasn't really been to a lot of places, I can see how they may not be as kind of as worldly or as open minded because they haven't seen these places. Yeah. Did you learn anything, uh, anything else about human nature while you're going out about seeing, meeting all these new people out there? Um, well, one thing that I've, I've always said is that Americans are very we are very arrogant about our culture and how totally. uh, <laughs> Americans we look at the rest of the world as outsiders, right? And when we meet people who don't speak fluent English, we might think they're not as smart or as intelligent just because they don't speak English fluently. But in other countries, they don't they do not do that to us. It, they don't have that as the reverse. So that's one thing that uh, always stood out to me. Man, I, uh, I that's gotta be a wild time getting to explore and you're like, oh my gosh, I am going bouncing from country to country. I want to skip ahead a little bit to you, you talked about 2009 is kind of this big shift in your life. So That's right. t- tell me, tell me a little bit more about, about that time, that time in your life and what, what you're kind of thinking about how that went down. So I found myself unemployed from basketball. I was a free agent. So I'm waiting for the phone to ring, waiting for my agent to call me and say, Hey, hey we have an opportunity for you. I played in a few places, but I wanted my career to keep going. Now, I'm in my mid to late 20s at this point, And I just asked myself a very important question, which was, how do I combine basketball with making money, with having control? Now, that, that's, that third point is what made it different than playing pro ball. Because pro basketball, even though it's, it's a job that fewer than 1% of people ever have, you're still a contract employee which means somebody has to approve of you having the job in order for you to have the job. So I wanted to know how can I get some control over my life to where I was calling the shot instead of somebody else calling that shot. And now I told you already about reading Kiyosaki back in the early 2000s. Now, at this point, I had recently read kind of like the rich dad, poor dad for the digital person, which was Tim Ferriss's four hour work week. Mm. Now, after I read, because his book was a similar principles, but it was for the digital world. His stuff was all based on using the Internet. So I took what I had read from Kiyosaki and some of the stuff from Tim and I combined that and I started making my own products. I started creating my own programs. So the first program I created was a four dollar and ninety nine cents. I actually created two of them, four dollars and ninety nine cents, one for dribbling the basketball and one for shooting, shooting program and a dribbling program. $4.99 each on one page websites, very, very primitive HTML websites. And I just made a video on YouTube about two minutes long announcing that I had these products. And I told people what website to go to to buy them. And I remember waking up the next morning and I had an email to say, congratulations, you made a sale of $4.99. So when good. I made that first sale, Blake, yeah, I said, this is what I need to be doing. This is what I'm going to be doing for the rest of my life. Because I knew that, again, as a professional athlete, those abilities eventually go away and there's a new wave of athletes who come in to take your spot. Sports are a young person's game. So I knew that if I, if I could take an idea from my head, turn it into a tangible thing, put a price tag on it, offer it to the world and someone would give me money for that. What we now know is intellectual property. 
I said, I can do this forever. I won't be able to jump 40 inches in the air forever, but I will be able to do this forever, use my Mm -hmm. brain forever. So that's how I knew what I was going to be doing next. So the thing for me that made it different from many athletes, especially when they're transitioning from sports to the rest of life, is that I started doing this in 2009. I didn't stop playing ball till 2015. Eventually, the phone did ring again. Yeah. But I didn't stop playing ball till 2015. So I had this five, six year period where I'm creating products. I'm writing books. I'm building my brand. I'm figuring out my framework. I'm figuring out. I figured out that there were people who didn't play basketball who were actually connecting with my message when I started talking about mindset stuff. So all of that stuff I already had momentum and I already had a lot of these pieces somewhat in place by the time I stopped playing basketball. I wasn't starting at zero like the day after I stopped playing. I already had a lot of momentum going by that point and I had an audience. That's incredible. And honestly, that's just, uh, it's very, that, yeah, that's, that's a genius way to do it because I always think about that. If you if you can see that there's an end in sight, <laughs> it's almost like you can see a cliff and then you can see that there's another jump here and you got to make right. it to the other side. You don't want to walk and then get to the cliff and then realize you have to jump one way or another. You want to get a mm-hmm. running start and just makes it that much easier to get to the other side. Um, right. And I uh, now I, I think that's that's incredible that you started doing that. Um, how did you start like. Like you just wrote a book. You know what I mean? Like sometimes people have, (laughs) I'm trying to figure out a better way to put it, but how did you start getting to a place where you're like, you know what, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna write, write a book. Like, was that kind of, was it as simple as that? And then you went for it or did you have to find a mentor or what was that like? No, it kind of was as simple as you said. So I've always been a writer. (laughs) I was a writer more. I was a writer before I was a athlete, before I was a basketball player. My mom's an educator. So she had, me and my sister reading and writing from a pretty young age. So I was blogging actually before I got on YouTube. It's just oh, the okay. videos on YouTube kind of took off. More people knew me from YouTube than blogging. So yeah. that's yeah. how people came to know me was the basketball videos. But I've always been a writer. I've always been a big writer. So around my first book came out in 2010 or 11. And at that time, that's when self-publishing was starting to become ubiquitous. Right? You mm-hmm. can publish your own book. So when I found out about that, I said, oh, I don't have to wait for a publishing company to want me for me to put a book out. I could just write it and put it out. I said, all right, I'm going to do that. So I just started writing. So my first book was just me telling my story just from basically from when I first started playing basketball up through my college years. Because at this time, my main audience was just basketball players ages 13 and 24 who just wanted to learn how to get better at basketball. So I was just telling my story in that book. Now, all these books I've written, that's the only one where I'm just telling the story. Every other one is more like uh, informational, self-help uh, business type things. But that's the yeah. only one that's just a storybook. So that one, I just wrote it. I barely even edited it or proofread it or anything. I remember when I went back to do the audio version of that book. It's called Buy a Game about five years later. And I'm reading it to do the audio. And I'm like, this writing is terrible. But the thing is, like nobody ever complained about that book. They never complained about the typos or the grammatical errors or anything because the audience was so dialed in that it was such a dialed in audience at that time that it didn't even matter that the writing wasn't that great, or at least not to my standards by that point. So that's how I first started writing. And then as I learned more about self-publishing, I just went and started writing books about mindset because that's what players were asking me about. That Yes, they wanted to learn how to dribble and shoot and all that, but I already had the programs for that. And then players just started asking, well, you know, why do you keep uh, how do you come to the gym every day to work out? How do you get the, the mindset yeah. to do that? Or how do you get the confidence to show up and perform in a game that the way that you do in practice? There's no pressure in practice, but it's pressure in the game. How do you get that? I started talking about confidence. The first one, let me talking about discipline. The second one's talking about confidence. Then when players would just ask, well, look, you got cut from your high school team three times. You walked on to play in college. How do you keep the vision alive? You could even become a pro athlete. I started talking about mental toughness or then they would ask, well, how'd you get started getting known on the Internet? Because now being known on the Internet was like a, a, a career aspiration for people. Right? This yeah. is starting to become yeah. a thing people wanted to do. So they would start asking me, how did I get known on the Internet? Because because these YouTube videos kind of had me known. So I started talking about personal initiative or I would get a lot of players asking, how do you get a contract to play overseas? Because there's a lot of ball players who want to play overseas. But because it's overseas and most people have never left the country, they have no idea what to do, where to begin, who to talk to. You know, so I started talking about taking initiative. In other words, basically being a salesperson, being a go getter. How do you go yeah. create opportunities for yourself? So Absolutely. those four principles, discipline, confidence, mental toughness, personal initiative became the foundation of work on your game. 
And when I started talking about those things, people who didn't play ball started finding my material. And they would reach out and say, Dre, I'm following you, not because I'm not trying to learn how to do the, the Kobe move. I don't want to play in the NBA. But the way you break down mindset, the way you explain the mental game, the way you're talking about it, you make it really easy to understand and you make it simple to apply. And people will just tell me, I just want to let you know, look, there are people who don't play ball who are listening to your messages. So that told me, OK, this is I, I saw this as an opportunity, Blake, because I understood that when I stopped going to the basketball court every day, I was no longer going to be cool to the basketball players. Like that next wave of players coming up, you're cool to them because you're on the court every day like they are. But if I'm not on the court every day, like you see what I'm wearing right now, you ask some 15 year old ball player about me. He doesn't know who I am because I'm Mm -hmm. not doing that anymore. But I said, okay, I can now let me start figuring out how can I connect to these people who don't play basketball? Because that's going to be my audience when I get out of this, because I knew I could foresee that when I stop playing basketball, uh, you're not that person to them anymore. Like you ask some 16 year old kid about Michael Jordan, they're like who? I mean, they know sneakers, but they don't know Michael Jordan, right? Yeah. Because he's not doing it every day anymore. And same way that 20 years from now, you ask some 15 year old kid about LeBron, they are going to know who he is, but he's not the cool guy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, 100. percent I, you know, yeah. I'm getting a sense of just, just total fearlessness out of this. You know, it's awesome, man. I. Uh, I, the fact that you're like, cause I think about the way people operate sometimes. And a lot of times when they see those challenges, they could very easily be like, I guess I got to go get a day job. Like, why did you, right. why do you think you didn't even consider that as an option? You're just like, I'm just going to look around the corner and plan ahead and get it done. You know? Great question. That's a great question. Well, first of all, uh, several reasons. Number one, as I already told you, like growing up, all the adults around me had day jobs and they, none of them seemed excited about their day jobs. So that kind of emotionally scarred me, I guess like we can say, from a day job. I did not want to have one because nobody nobody seemed excited about their day job. It was like yeah. this necessary evil that when you become a grown up, this is just what you have to do. You just got to go to work and you know, not like your job, complain about your bosses and your coworkers after work. And then you still don't have any money, even though you're at work all the time. So that was number one. <laughs> number two, uh, when I went to school, now I went to college, I have a college degree. I remember sitting in my classes, I have a business degree. And I remember sitting in my classes the last two years, because at my the last two years of college, you're kind of focused on your degree classes, your degree track. Totally. So it was like all the same students in almost all my classes, the same people. And I remember looking around the classroom and I'm like, these people are all... They're all were kind of on the same in the same mindset. And I was kind of different. And I was like, I'm I don't want to do the same thing that these people are all doing because they were all on their ways to getting a job, having a good career and you know, working at some company for the next 40 years and then retiring with a gold watch. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I don't want to do that. Like whatever these people are doing, I don't want to do it. And yeah. I was the kind of student in college, I guess you call it. I was like the C student. I mean, I was smart enough to get A's, but I didn't give enough effort to get an A. I did give enough effort to get a C. Yeah, I was a C student, which and I knew that based on my effort in college, because that's what that's what the school system is in America. The school system is set up so that you learn to comply and know follow the rules. And the better you do at that, the better job you're going to get. And then you go to your job and you do the same thing. You comply, follow the rules. You do that well. You get you get promoted and you move up and then you work there for 40 years. But I knew I wasn't that type of person. So I said, mm-hmm. I don't want to get in the same race that my classmates are getting in because they're going to beat me because I'm not I don't want to run this race. Mm-hmm. So I knew I was going to do something different and I was just trying to figure out what it was. So, the, again, the first thing was basketball. And then when I went to that network marketing meeting uh, based off a, a bulletin board posting, you know, with the little phone numbers, you rip off and call the phone number. Yeah, that's how I that's how I got introduced to that. So but cool, I'm so man. glad that I did, because when I went to that meeting, these people were name dropping uh, Brian Tracy, Napoleon Hill, Jim Rohn, Tony Robbins. I said, who are these people? And I started go- looking up those books and reading them. And I read Think and Grow Rich. I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad while I was in college. And when I read those books, I said, OK, there's a whole class of people out here who are doing something different than what everybody else is doing. So whatever they're doing, I'm going to do that. That's what I that's the mindset that I had coming out of college. Again, C student. I knew I didn't want to go into the normal uh, process because I would have been a very below, I would have been a below average person in that world based on my, based on my mindset. And then um, once the internet came around, Blake, and we saw YouTube where you could kind of 
YouTube's first um, slogan was broadcast yourself. I don't know if people remember that back in the day. You say broadcast yourself. So you can put yourself out there. And then blogging came out. So I was, when I saw blogging, I said, oh, so I can take whatever I'm thinking. I can write it, pit publish, and the whole world, it could just go out to the whole world for them to see it. And then you know, all the social media apps started coming. Facebook came and then Twitter came and then you know, later on Instagram and all that stuff. And I said, well, I could just put myself out to the world and share whatever I'm thinking with the world. And I have a direct line of communication to them. I said, I'm going to go for this. 100%. Now, mind you, there's right now, mind you, there's no money to be made from this until maybe around 2009 ish. That's when they things started to be monetizable and things like that. But at that point, I'm playing ball. I know basketball is ending. So that's why I'm looking around. I'm looking for the next opportunity. So I read Kiyosaki. And then when I read Tim Ferriss, I said, OK, there's something here. After I read Tim Ferriss, because in Tim Ferriss's book, he, again, he's talking about similar principles because a lot of people don't know Tim's background, how he got to writing the four hour work week because he was running his own business. But he was running himself into the ground because he was working like 70 hour weeks. But he was about to be exhausted. He was like, it has to be an easier way to do this. So he started utilizing all these digital tools that we had. And that's how he came up with those principles. So when I was reading his stuff and I said, all right, he did all this through the Internet. And he kind of created this business entity to where he can make money just using tools that are on the Internet. And everything he was talking about was available to anybody. Mm -hmm. So when I read that, I said, OK. I don't know exactly what I'm going to do, but I remember telling somebody even then, because at this point I had a little buzz from all these YouTube videos. There's no money being made on YouTube, but I had fans and I had this blog and I and I could see that people really liked the way that I was communicating. They liked the way that I wrote. They liked the way that I spoke and the way I explained things. I said, whatever this is that I have on the Internet is going to be bigger than even what I'm doing in basketball. I knew that uh, over 10 years ago. I knew this was going to be bigger. And I knew it would last longer also, as a matter of fact. So that's that was the mentality that I had. So I was just looking for how do I make this work? And the good thing is I had basketball going. So that kind of gave me some space to where I could have some time to figure it out. And at the same time, I told you I'm a computer geek. So I yeah. can if it's figure outable, I'm going to figure it out. So I was able to figure it out. And that's you know, how we got here. You know, I always wonder about whenever you're on that journey too, I mean, was everybody kind of like, yeah, do you like, I'm like pumped and they got it. Cause sometimes I know it can be kind of, it can be isolating whenever you're trying to figure out your own thing mm -hmm. and only you understand that vision in that moment before you start bringing in the right key players with you. I mean, was everybody, or what was your experience like whenever you're kind of telling everybody, Hey, this is my plan, you know? Um, I wasn't telling anybody. <laughs> so, <laughs> I didn't tell anybody that was my plan. Nice. I didn't, no, I wasn't telling anybody that. You know, I'm, I'm playing ball. So if you ask anybody, what does Dre do? Oh, he plays basketball. Like yeah. And then there was the, once the YouTube started to pick up some momentum. Now it was around that 2009 through 2011 ish during that period. Yeah. People stopped because it, before that it was, if you were, putting content on the internet as and you were spending a lot of time on that. You were like a loser living in your mom's basement who needed to get a real job. <laughs> yep. Right. But then around that time from 09 to about 11, that's when people who had an audience on the internet were starting to be looked at as cool. We were looked at as pioneers because now everybody's starting to do it. Now Google buys YouTube. So now they're starting to monetize it and they're like, oh, wait a minute. People could actually make money doing this. So now everybody's looking at it. Everybody started watching. And then around 12 moving forward, then everybody started doing it. Everybody started creating content. Everybody became a creator. So at that time, people would see me and say, well, congratulations on all your success. Even though it wasn't that, even that much money to be made through uh, putting content out. But because you had a name, you were somebody. Right. Absolutely. I was making I was making more money from selling products than I was from getting looked at on YouTube. But people didn't know about the products I was selling. They knew about the YouTube. Right. So a lot of times people don't even they're looking at the wrong thing and they're impressed by the thing that's not even the thing you should be impressed by. But they don't understand what they they don't know what they don't know. You yeah. Know what I mean, yeah, so no, that's is, is a lot of pieces that go into it. People who don't know the game that they just yeah. watch. Yeah. So is that kind of when they whenever you started being looked at as like a pioneer on the Internet, was that around the time when they asked you to do a TED talk? What was that? What was that kind of like? Oh, no, no, that, that's not where it came from. But I'll tell you where that came from. So. <laughs> I didn't do my first TED Talk until 2015. Now, 
people were calling me like a pioneer and you built a brand and it's impressive what you're doing on the internet. That was like 2010. Now, the TED Talk came about, this was around 2014, going into 15. I was, I think it was, I think it was Tim Ferriss podcast again. I'm promoting this guy on your show here, but uh, <laughs> he had a, he had a guy named Derek Sivers on his show. You familiar with Derek Sivers? I have heard, yeah, I have his uh, his his book. I'm pretty sure I have his book. Same. Yeah, he got a, he has a few books. Yeah, so uh, so Derek was on uh, Tim's podcast, and you know Tim's interviews are like three hours, so they're talking. And at the end of that interview, Derek was saying. Well, because he was talking about how he does speaking gigs and things like that. And from the audience that I had on the Internet, a lot of the players and just people who were watching me said, Jerry, we really like the way that they just like the way that I was articulate and the way that I could express myself. And you know, being an athlete, I can say this. Non-athletes should not say this. But a lot of athletes can't talk. They can't speak. They don't know how to express them. They can't really put their words together. But when they heard me talking, they said, Dre, you really can express yourself well. You you sound like a you sound like a philosopher. You sound like a college professor. Right. So I figured maybe I can go into professional speaking. But mm-hmm. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't even know it was a, a thing. I didn't know people <laughs> would pay you money to stand on the stage for an hour and just talk. But when I found out about it, I said, well, maybe I'll do that. So I hear Derek Sivers, he's being interviewed, and he says he does speaking gigs and he gets paid for them. And then at the end of his interview, he said, if anybody wants to reach out to me and ask a question, he said, I read every email I get. I get thousands of emails, but I actually read them all. So I emailed the guy. And he actually wrote me back. And he said, well, look, if you want to get into profession, and I gave him a little bit of background on myself. He mm-hmm. said, well, you want to yeah. get into speaking? He said, the best way you can start is maybe try to give a TED talk. Go to the TED website and look up your local area and see if there's a talk in your area and then you can apply. And I said, all right, I'll give it a shot. And he said, all right, cool. And I went and looked up TED Talks in my area. I live in South Florida and I just applied. And the thing about a lot of people think that getting a TED Talk is about you being famous or known or anything like that. No, the the key point to landing a TED Talk is there's an application page. It's one page. They're going to ask you, what's the big idea? What is it about? Why are you qualified to speak about it? And you know, just talk, give us a little bit about it. That page is what determines whether you get booked or you don't. So I, you have to sell yourself on a one page written application. That's how you get it or don't get it. Dang. So I know how to sell myself. And yeah. That's something that I've always been good at. I know how to sell myself. That's how I got on playing ball. And that's how I got on the internet. And that's how I got on the TED stage. And all four of my TED Talks, none of them was somebody calling me and say, hey, Dre, we want you to come speak on our stage. Zero. All four of them was me going to them and selling myself. And that's how I got on stage. That's incredible. And that's so cool. I didn't know about the TED Talk process either. Like, so yeah, a lot of people don't know that. No, that's that's really cool. It's interesting to think about, you know, how many times in life you just got to go do it if you want it. That's you right. know, <laughs> it's kind of funny, mm-hmm. uh, but a lot of people, a lot of people don't. Um, I've been while we've been talking, I've been kind of reflecting on your your four kind of tenets or your, that created the foundation of everything you've been talking about: confidence, mm-hmm. you know, uh, mental toughness. Um, I, I want to hear a little bit about like, how did you discover these? Because was this just something where you were like, y- you just, you just knew it or like, were there life experiences that happened that led you through to figure out each of these individually? Like how did they, uh, hmm. how'd you form those? Good question. So, and they go in order. So the first one is discipline and where the discipline comes from this one. All the other three, I would say I had to develop them over time. But the discipline one, I have to give credit to my upbringing. You know, I give credit to my parents. My parents are not athletes. You know, I'm six feet, four inches tall. My dad's like five, eight. My mom's five, <laughs> seven. So they're not athletes all right, and definitely not basketball players. But they were all about, you know, uh, respect, respecting authority, do your chores, do your homework, et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera. You know, no video games on school days. You no, know, you can't play. You're going to go outside on the weekends. That kind of stuff. So that at home, home training discipline, I got that from my parents. And then when I got to the basketball court, I just took that discipline that I learned at home because that's the only thing that I knew. I took that with me to basketball. So nobody taught me how to play ball. I just kept going to the court every day and just trying stuff until things started working. So that's where the discipline part comes from. The confidence part, you know, as a kid, as a super young kid, I wasn't always very confident. Many times I didn't have confidence. Do you remember... um, Back in the 90s, used to be a TV show called Family Matters. Of course. And there was a, yeah. and the main character was Steve Urkel. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. All right. Classic. So I used to wear, yeah. So I wear contact lenses, but I used to wear glasses. All right, I used to wear the bifocals. <laughs> so now, ner- nowadays, nerds are cool, right? But back then, nerds were not cool, right? <laughs> nerds got laughed at, right? Back in the nineties. So I used to wear those glasses, and I didn't have that confidence back then. So because I know what it feels like to not have any confidence, and I know what it feels like to be fully confident, I can help anybody with confidence because I've seen the entire range. So the confidence really came in uh, for me. First of all, as I started to get more success as an athlete, and then also just as I you know, just grew into myself and mm-hmm. my speaking skills started to become more obvious. And of course, being an athlete on a college campus, you know, everybody knows who you are, you know, especially on the basketball team. There's only 12 of us. So mm-hmm. that that confidence started to build along with my ability to communicate. Then the mental toughness was just understanding that things are not always going to work out, even when you have you know, the best laid plans of mice and men you know, often go awry. Right. Mm-hmm. Things don't always go the way you think they're going to go. And this was, again, I only played one year of high school ball. Nobody would have suggested to me to try to play in college. Then playing in college at the D3 level, no one would have suggested try to play pro. And then I actually ended up making it happen. So, again, I was kind of at the bottom where anybody would have said, OK, nobody would have bet money on me becoming a pro athlete unless they're like a and a, uh, a sophisticated investor who understands betting at the bottom, right? <laughs> uh, betting on the valley, so uh, you might win. But nobody would have bet on that. And then the fact that I was able to make it happen, now I had the credibility to say to somebody, look, all right, this is where I was at. All right, so I can tell you about what it means to be at the bottom of something looking up and then to keep working on it and go ahead and make it happen. So this is the things, those things, the discipline part, the confidence and mental toughness, all of those really came from when I was, making a basketball material because the ball players, I mean, you might think that the the most introspective questions will come from some sophisticated adult who's in the middle of their career, but actually it was coming from these 13 to 24 year olds because when they saw my, they saw what I was doing on the court, they could see this guy clearly can play. He's playing at the pro level. But then when they found out my background, one year high school, walked on at a D3 college, they know what D3 college means. Like a lot of adults don't know what that means. They know what it means. They know what it means to play one year. They know what it means to sit on the bench. So when they saw me as this successful guy in basketball, but then they found out the background, they said, wait a minute, how'd you do that? Because many of them could relate to me because a bunch of them were sitting on the bench in high school. A bunch of them were getting cut from their team. A bunch of them were out of high school, not even enrolled in college, but wondering if they could still have a shot at making it pro. So they saw me and they said, all right, this guy, I can relate to him. Like You could be a fan of LeBron and Steph Curry. But you can't relate to LeBron and Steph Curry because no. you weren't that, right? But yeah. you can relate to me. So they would ask me stuff like, man, um, what drives you to keep coming to the gym every day to work out, even though there were times when you didn't even know what you're working out for, right? And they would say, well, how do you get the confidence to show up and perform at that? I mean, think about that high school sports. Uh, tryouts are like one day. All right, so you practice all year for that one day. If you have a bad day that one day, it doesn't matter what you did all year to get ready for it. You got to wait a whole other year to do it again. So how do you get that confidence to perform right there in that moment? Because they knew about the exposure camps. Exposure camps like a job fair for athletes, for the listeners who don't know. You pay money to go to this event. You get basically about two or three days. And there's a bunch of people watching who can make or break your career. And if you play well during that two or three days, you can take off. You play terribly. Nobody cares what you did to get ready for it. So it's like a casting call, but paid. So again, they knew about that. They knew that's what I did to get on. So they would ask about confidence then. And also just the way that I was, I would communicate. And then the mental toughness. I mean, the whole story. All right. How do you, because players would say to me, well, I just got cut from my high school team today, Dre. I would get comments on YouTube. I just got cut from my team today. All right. Can you tell me something? Why should, should I keep going? Should I quit? I would get parents, a lot of parents, a lot of mothers reaching out to me. Hey, Dre, uh, my son watches your videos on YouTube all the time. I see I see it, see you over his shoulder when I'm looking at him on a computer. He's got cut from his team today and he's feeling terrible. I don't know what to say to him. This is a mother. She doesn't know anything about sports. She doesn't know what to say. And I would get these messages from them all the time. And then I would go make a video kind of to speak to all of those players because every year now, more players get cut than make the team. Right. Man. So, yeah. 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 So true. then when they got cut, the first thing they would do, they can't go to their mom. Their mom doesn't know anything about basketball. What is she going to say? Right. Yes, they would go to YouTube. Right. Yeah. They would go to YouTube and they would watch me and I would give them the message that they needed to hear. And even to this day, um, wait, 
I've had young men, several young men come to me and say, Dre, look, I grew up without my father. Uh, I didn't have any brothers. You were like the closest thing to a father figure I had oh watching you on YouTube, like the things that you were saying. And you taught me things because I would make these videos called the weekly motivation every Monday. And that was the mindset piece. Those I actually should have talked about this earlier. Those videos kind of became the foundation of what I have now, because that was I was talking to the athletes, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a sports topic. It was a mindset topic. So that's where the discipline, confidence, mental toughness initiative. I was talking about those things every Monday and like a little selfie video. So when I made those people who didn't play ball started finding me and they would say, look, I know you're talking to athletes, but what you're saying is for anybody. That's how I knew what I was going to do next from the weekly motivations. So those players, they were the ones really who helped lay the foundation for work on your game because they would ask me the questions that led to me saying what I was saying that led to you know what we have now. That became the foundation of it. So and then the initiative part was just go do something. So getting on YouTube when nobody told me to get on YouTube, putting my money down to go to that exposure camp. That was I went to that exposure camp in 2005. That was my last two hundred fifty dollars in cash. Right. I didn't have a bank account or a credit card. I paid them in cash. Can you imagine giving somebody two hundred fifty dollars in cash today? <laughs> and some people don't even take cash. Right. <laughs> yeah, two hundred fifty dollars yeah. in cash at the door. Right. In Orlando. We drove from Philly to Orlando. Fifteen hours Damn. just to play in that exposure camp. And I had two days to either make or break. All right. Then it was just even trying to play pro basketball. You came from a D3 college. Uh, you didn't kill it at the D3, but you're going to try to play pro basketball. Why? Right. Who even has that idea? Who does that? Right. So all these times where I took initiative and this is why I became an entrepreneur, because, again, when I read Kiyosaki and I read Tim Ferriss, I said, all right, these guys are talking about the way that I think I already naturally thought like that. And what they were saying said, OK, it validated the way that I was thinking, OK, there are people out here who think like this It's just not it's not the majority of people. It's not these people I was in college in class with. It's not them. It's not my professors. It's these people over here in these books over here. So this is why I'm I'm so thankful that my mother, you know, as an educator, had me reading because she gave me that that reading book. And because I'm such a big reader, I'm a big writer. Right. So all yeah, these pieces yeah. come together. And it's, right. you know, when you when you look at that, I it's so cool to see that improvement is always residual. You know, it's uh, mm-hmm. it, it's it's just that little tiny percent day by day that's almost invisible. And I, it seems, sounds like you gave a lot of hope to a lot of people out there. I mean, that's got to give you mm-hmm. that's got to give you so much so much drive uh, to keep keep doing more. I mean, at what point when you were looking at all of this and reaching people all over the place, did you ever have that kind of moment where you were like, "Man, I think I I think I've really got something here." Like uh, that moment where you got to just relax for maybe two seconds, maybe not two seconds even, but just look at it and go, "Man, I think I I'm getting the traction that I I want out of this." Yeah, that was probably around 09. That was 2009. Yeah. So that's when, um, again, my audience slowly built on YouTube because I wasn't doing it. I was doing it sporadically whenever I felt like making a video because, again, there was no I wasn't getting anything from it except yeah. you no know, thanks from commentators. But then when Google purchased YouTube and they started sending me little emails, hey, we'll monetize your video. You'll make some money off this. I said, all right, I'm going to put a video out every day. If I can make money on every video, why not make a video every day? So that's when I started putting them out every day. And then I actually saw, I remember I got the first, um, like the deposit, the AdSense deposit from YouTube for a hundred dollars because the threshold is a hundred dollars, right? Yeah, so you got to yeah. make at least a hundred dollars to get the money. And they sent me a hundred dollars. I said, Oh, okay. If I can keep doing this, all right, maybe I can make a thousand. All right, let's see. And I just kept doing it. And, yeah, at that point, that's when I said, okay, let's let's just keep going with this. But I knew I didn't want to just do that because you know, YouTube is still getting damn near half the money. So all right, how can I make some where I got control? Totally. Over? Yeah. And finding that new audience, do you, do you see a lot of overlap with what you know motivated and and what helped out? I guess all of the all the athletes is it similar to what's helping out a lot of the entrepreneurs now? Oh, that's a good question. Now the mindset piece, yes, they do need it. The difference is nowadays with with entrepreneurs, just with adults, period, is that they're you got to peel back a little bit more to kind of get to what they really need. A, a 13 to 24 year old, you could kind of they'll tell you right there off the top on the surface what it is. Yeah. But with a lot of adults, you kind of we got all these years of of stuff 
in us that you got to kind of peel through to get to get to what they really need. And often people think they need one thing and they actually need another thing. And yeah, so it's a little <laughs> bit different with it's a little bit different with adults and that you got to kind of get through. You got to get through their shells, whereas a teenager doesn't have as hard of a shell. They still have one, but not not nearly as built up as an adult does. OK, yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And you see across your across your clients, what's the most common of your you know tenants that they're they need the most help in? Is there a most common one, or is it just all over the place? It's mental toughness. Mental toughness. It's always always mental toughness. Yes, yeah. it's dealing with the inevitable setbacks. Now, the one thing I will say with grownups is that the setbacks uh, have much more impact. Than with a kid, uh, a kid doesn't make the high school team and the, to them. That's their whole world. But is it really a big deal? Not really. But no. adults, yeah. uh, we're talking about you no know, business deals. You're talking about uh, losing the contract, You're talking about a job offer, You're talking about making a decision. Do I take this job, not take this job, uh, getting a divorce? You no, know, all these kind of things with adults is much more, uh, much more gravity to these situations. And how do I deal with them? That's a big thing with adults. And also, uh, if we're talking about as an entrepreneur, you're selling things. Mindset is harder to sell because it's not tangible, right? So sure. when I, I also help people with business stuff, right? but you got to find your you got to find your niche. You got to find your zone. You know, or do you want to help people with things that can help them make money? Now, that might be a person who hasn't made that much money yet. Now, yeah. can they afford to pay you? Right. So now it's like these you got to find that you got to find that sweet spot of who are the type of people you want to help and how do you want to help them and do they want your help also all of those things you got to find that spot that zone i was going to ask about that yeah people get pretty yeah. sounds like people get pretty real with you in these conversations like you get to you get to actually know you get to really know a lot of these people i mean do you ever come across people that aren't very coachable and and if somebody's not very coachable do you, do you, do you tend to challenge? What's kind of your process? Do you have any advice for somebody that's kind of in that? Cause I don't know. It seems like some people maybe either lack self-awareness to know like, dang, or, or they have, they're dealing with their ego or yeah. How do you mm. handle some of that when you come across it? Yeah. Well, somebody's not coachable. They never become a client. <laughs> so <laughs> cool. they have yeah, to be coachable for it, us to even get that far. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If they're not coachable, then we're not even going to get to the point that I can coach them because they're not even going to be open to the conversation. Mm -hmm. Hands down. Mm -hmm. Dre, but thank you so much for hopping on this podcast, man. I, I have loved getting to learn about your story. Uh, and I usually like to ask just a couple of uh, common questions at the end to kind of wrap up here. So I, sure. I would want to know what is one of, do you have any myths that you would dispel around like coaching and mindset that you think are some commonly held beliefs that, that you would say maybe that's something you, you you shouldn't you shouldn't take as a truth necessarily. Yeah, I got about twenty, but I'm not going to give them all to you. <laughs> so uh, we'll talk after. <laughs> yeah, one thing I'll tell you about coaching is that the the best coaches have the best players, and this came from uh, John Wooden, the legendary coach of UCLA. And he won like ten championships, and someone once said to him, "Coach, how did you become so good? How did you become such an amazing coach?" And he said, "Well, easy, he had the best players." And he was kind of being tongue in cheek, but he was also being serious. And what that has to do with uh, for all the listeners here who are actual you no know, coaches, not sports coaches, but coaches. Your coaching business is reflective of the type of clients that you decide to take on. Now, you take on bummy clients, you're going to have a bummy coaching practice because they're not going to do anything. They're not going to implement what you tell them. And you're going to look bad because you took on a bad client. Are your the best coaches are the people who take on the best clients. And the thing is, a lot of coaches probably don't want to admit this out loud, but the best coaches have clients who are going to do the work and going to be successful anyway. Mm -hmm. All right. They just happen to they just happen to use you as a conduit for their success. But you didn't make them successful. Like I, my best clients are not people who I made successes. You can't make anybody be a success. Is people are going to be successful anyways. Like Phil Jackson didn't make Michael Jordan a success. Michael Jordan would have been the guy no matter who was coaching. Yeah. Right. Because Michael Jordan's Michael Jordan. Right? Kobe Bryant's Kobe Bryant. So the best coaches have the best players. So all you coaches out there, this may be a bruise to your ego, but it's, it's not you that makes those clients so great. It's their good clients already. You just get the you just get to help them get to where they want to get to. So that's one that I would give you. And I'll give mm -hmm. you one more on the mindset side is uh, there's no such thing as too much confidence. 
And a lot of people think that having too much confidence may be a problem. I would hear this from athletes all the time and even even uh, non-athlete people. Well, Dre, yeah, I want to be confident, but not too confident because then people might think I'm arrogant or cocky or I might turn people off. Listen, how, how many times have you gotten in trouble in life from being too confident? I usually ask that question. Never. Nobody can answer it. People Never. just laugh, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I ask the audience that question. People just laugh in spite of themselves <laughs> because they can't even think of a time that's ever happened. But you can tell yeah. me plenty of times where you didn't have enough confidence and you blew an opportunity or you just didn't do something where you saw a chance to do it. But people are so worried about being too confident. It's like a person who's never lifted weights before saying, well, hey, I do want to work out, but I don't want to get too bulky. Like, wait a minute. Let's, like, let's First of all, let's make sure you know how to get to the gym. Like, then we'll you know, worry about you having too many bulky? muscles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll worry we'll worry about you having too many muscles after you actually come to the gym a few times. Yeah. So too much confidence is not a problem. And if people could just try having too much confidence, see what it does for you. You might think differently. Man, I love that. That is, uh, that's some, those are some great myths to dispel. And for anybody that, cause you, you've mentioned it a few times, there are not that many people that have that mindset. There's the majority thinks in that kind of similar mindset where they're like, yep, I'm going to go and get my job, uh, you know, the necessary evil that you kind of talked about. What about, mm. so for people that want to do life the way that you do, do you have any kind of advice for them if they're, if they're, you know, on that journey right now? Yeah. The great thing for people today, I mean, in 2023 is that the tools are obvious and available and open and uh, they're kind of getting pushed on you nowadays. Whereas 10 years ago, you had to be looking for these things. You had to really take initiative. Nowadays, you just got to like look around and they're going to get thrown in your face. So I would say, uh, first of all, you got to get a real world education, not an American educational system education, but a real world education, meaning you need to invest in yourself and learn from people who are actually out here playing the entrepreneurial game. So that means read their books, listen to their podcasts, listen to the interviews of people who are interviewing people who are out there in the game. And you're going to pick up those jewels, um, get their courses, go to their conferences, invest in the conferences. I would definitely suggest to someone who's trying to get into the entrepreneurial game, you should be going to two or three conferences every year in person and physically. And it's not even about the people speaking from the stage It's about meeting the other people in the room because you're going to be in a room full of people who are all out there hustling, playing the game. And those are the people who you need to be around because there are so many people. We are a small percentage of people. Uh, we are the entrepreneurs 100%. who are actually in the game. We are not the majority. And you're going to go back home and you're going to be around a bunch of people who are not in that majority. You got to make sure you stay connected to the people who are in there and get that circle. You got to have that association because we all know the law of association. Become the average of the people you spend the most time with. So you got to be connecting with those people who are actually in the game and playing it actively so that your mind can stay in the right space, even though you're facing setbacks, even though things are not working, and even though you're surrounded by other people who are not in that game. So that's the most important thing. Dre, I am pumped up, man. I am pumped up. I, I so appreciate your time today. And uh, where can people find out more about you? Tell me, is there any kind of any kind of thing people should be checking out right now? All right, perfect. So I have an event actually coming up February 3rd and 4th here in Miami. It is called Work On Your Game Live. So that's my live in-person event. Two full days. We're going to be going over the, everything we talked about here. Mindset, right. strategy, systems, execution. Two full days in Miami, Florida. You can get your ticket at workonyourgame.live, L-I-V-E, workonyourgame.live is where you get your ticket to that event. Two full days. I'll be teaching uh, both days. We'll give you coffee, donuts, and all of that. It's going to be in a beautiful location down here in South Florida. It's 80 degrees today. Amazing. Uh, no better place to be. All right, y'all. You, you, you heard it here. You got to go check it out. That sounds amazing. Thanks again. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And uh, please remember to subscribe and check out our Instagram at uh, Gem Series Podcast. Dre, thank you again. Uh, this has been the Gem Series. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Gem Series, the podcast for anybody dedicated to investing in themselves. If you'd like to see the resources mentioned in this episode, learn more about what we are up to at Rocket Level, or come over and join our team, just click on the links below. Until next time, this is Blake Chapman, and remember to be awesome and do awesome things.